Hi, I'm Nadia Combs, Chair of the Hillsborough County School Board. I want to welcome you to Hillsborough County Public Schools. We serve more than 200,000 students. That includes children in preschool through adults in our workforce program. I am Henry Shake Washington, the Board Vice Chair. Our district is the seventh largest in America, and our team is made up of more than 24,000 people working at nearly 250 sites across the county. Our district is diverse and dedicated. Our board meetings are held in our board auditorium on select Tuesdays at 4 p.m. The best way to serve our students and our community is to involve you, the public, in what we do. You are welcome to email or meet with any of our board members and follow our district on social media. Board meetings are covered live by Hillsborough Schools TV on Spectrum Cable Channel 635 and Frontier Cable Channel 32. Meetings are also streamed live on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Closed captioning is provided on all broadcasts and past meetings are available in our online archive. We are interested in what the public has to say. We'll include time for audience comments before we address our business items. Our agenda and any supporting materials can be viewed online in advance. They are posted seven days before each meeting on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Our vision is preparing students for life. And that means all students, every day. Todos los estudiantes, todos los días. Thank you for your interest in education. With your help, we're making decisions that shape our community's future. The board meeting of June 6, 2023 is called to order. Member Washington will now lead us in a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Thank you, Member Washington. We have no withdrawn items today. I need a motion a second to adopt the agenda. I have a motion by Member... Okay, I'm sorry. It's not on my. Uh, it's not up here on this queue. By um, Member Vaughn, and I have a second by Member Washington. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. Let the record reflect that all board members are in present with the exception of Member Gray, Member Hahn, and Member Perez. We have two sets of minutes to be approved today, April 11, 2023, school board workshop, and then May 9, 2023, school board meeting. I need a motion a second to approve the minutes. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Vaughn. Any discussion? If not, please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. Board members, I'd like to go over the format of today's meeting. As a reminder, we're a nonpartisan board who believe that all children can be empowered to learn to succeed, and our decisions will be made with that understanding. To pave the way for efficient and effective agenda statements and or questions, board members will have five minutes to speak with 30 seconds left for final thoughts. Afterward, the superintendent can respond. If you have further questions, you're asked to get back into the queue. Member Washington will now go over the board guidelines. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. As we begin this afternoon meeting, let me quickly review the format of our school board meetings. Please silence all electronic devices. Uh, there are speakers in the room behind me that allow board members to hear the meeting upon stepping away from the dais. This meeting can be viewed on live webcast on, and on cable TV. Thank you, Member Washington. We have now one item scheduled for time certain, and that's 6 o'clock, and that's employee input. Um, we will go on to the recognition and proclamations. 
AO1 Suchi Patel recognized for winning the Congressional App Challenge Award. Member Washington will be highlighting this recognition. Thank you, Madam Chair, and this is truly a, a privilege from one tiger to another one. Um, each year, the U.S. House of Representatives conduct a Congressional App Challenge where members of the Congress host a, hold a contest in that district for Miller and high school students, encourage them to learn to code and pursue careers in computer science by creating an app. Each participating member of Congress selects a winning app from their district. Suchi Patel, now a senior at George S. Milton High School, won the 2022 Congressional App Challenge for the district represented by Florida Congressman Scott Franklin. Ms. Patel created a smartphone app called the MyRx that allowed the user to scan a medication to see if any foods or medications counteract with medication. Mrs. Patel, please join us at the lectern so we can congratulate you and you can briefly talk about the app you have created and your inspiration. Mrs. Patel, thank you. Tiger One? Tiger All. All right. <laughs> thank you so much, Mr. Washington. It's a pleasure to be here in front of all of you esteemed um, school board members. Um, what actually motivated me to start coding was the biotechnology program at my magnet school, and I'm really grateful for that program for educating me in terms of you know learning how to use web programming and developing an app from the from the scratch. So um, my grandfather actually. Um, went to the hospital because of an adverse drug to drug interaction and so after seeing you know the medical inequity in my family um, I decided to pursue something that would benefit everyone in my community so I hope that this app will be able to you know bridge um, medical inequities within our community as well as educate those especially who are older about various prescriptions and help them manage you know their medications better so that you know we reduce the um, prevalence of antibiotic resistance within our community and beyond. So thank you. And I must say, that, that's truly phenomenal. That's, that's phenomenal. That's great. I'm, I mean, phenomenal. <laughs> that's all I can say. I can't say nothing else. You can't get better than that, people, I don't think. Um, now, so I want to congratulate you, Mr. Patel, and I want you, I want all your family and friends to please stand and be acknowledged. Family and friends, please stand. And thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you and congratulations. AO2, the recognition of students with perfect attendance from kindergarten through 12th grade. Anne Marie Courtney, Director in Partnership of Engagement, Philanthropy, and Outreach, will be highlighting this recognition. Good afternoon, board members, Mr. Davis, cabinet members. Today we recognize seven students who have grown who have shown great commitment to excuse me, to their education through a demonstration of perfect attendance, kindergarten through 12th grade, that's 13 years of perfect attendance, or 2,340 days of perfect attendance. James Wumach, once said, commitment unlocks the doors of imagination, allows vision, and gives us the right stuff to turn our dreams into reality. I do not know if these seven students will recognize, we recognize tonight had a dream to earn perfect attendance from kindergarten through their senior year of high school, but they have made it a reality. Each of our seven graduating seniors with perfect K-12 attendance will be presented a brand new laptop our partner, Suncoast Credit Union, is kindly providing us each student with a $500 scholarship. We have Courtney Berry, the Executive Director of Suncoast Credit Union Foundation with us this evening. Courtney.
It is my honor to introduce you to these extraordinary students. Dylan Quigley, Alonzo High School, please wave. <laughs> Anthony Jonidas, King High School. Alicia Thomas, King High School. Dante Patterson, Middleton High School. Hi. Eric Dyer, Newsom High School. <laughs> Tyler Rial, Newsom High School. And not with us this evening because he is celebrating his graduation with his family, Mason Sharabru from Riverview High School. Students, as you begin your journey beyond high school, I am confident that this accomplishment forecasts many successes in your future. A special thank you to the parents and families of these incredible students. Your support of your child's commitment to their education is greatly appreciated. Another heartfelt thank you to Courtney Berry with Suncoast Federal Credit Union and our generous partners in education for these wonderful prizes for these amazing students. Congratulations, graduates. If we could go ahead and stay, Dylan, go ahead and stay so we could get some pictures. I know the families would love to have some pictures. Superintendent Davis wanted to say something. Yes, ma'am, the chair. First and foremost, uh, this doesn't happen without committed parents, caregivers. If you're a parent or caregiver of, of these students, please stand up and let's recognize you for your hard work, dedication. We appreciate you. We understand when that uh, alarm clock goes off and they may not want to get up and you've helped them get up. And we, you've taken them to and from school, to and from activities. We thank you so very much for your hard work, your dedication. But students, uh, you know, remarkable. I can't tell you that I had the same track record, you know, over the last couple of weeks. <laughs> Just kidding. But uh, thank you for what you do. Thank you for being exemplars for our school district. And thank you for always being committed to your teachers, or they are committed to you as well. So thank you so very much. And we appreciate Suncoast. Yes, Congratulations. Good job. Congratulations. That's a huge accomplishment. We will now move on to public comment. The board welcomes comments from citizens and values your input to the board. In order to provide the most comprehensive response to your comments, our staff will follow up with you and we'll keep our board informed about the responses. Our school board respects the public's right to speak and the board, and we appreciate you taking the time to be here. However, it is requested when you address the board, comments are not directed personally against the board member or staff member, but rather directed at the issues. Any behavior intended to interrupt the orderly conduct of this meeting will not be allowed. Our civility policy is in place. When addressing the board, please state your name and speak clearly into the microphone. This afternoon, each speaker will have three minutes. Reminder that you, your three minutes start when you begin speaking. When there are 30 seconds left, you'll have, see a yellow light on the lectern, a red light, and a chime will indicate when your time is up. I'll now call up the first few speakers. If the first five speakers will please um, line up. Mark Lutho Largo, start with 708. You're going to take bids for these chemicals, insecticides, probably in 
including uh, what you're putting out to kill the uh, rats, which uh, then kills the owls. Yeah, isn't that a shame? Headlines, Earth is nearing the tipping point for a hot future. Earth's carbon dioxide levels at highest levels in 4 million years. Record war has melted oldest, thickest Arctic ice. Climate panel foresees big trouble as, as the Earth warms. Rising tide of dire warmings. Will the world we live in today still be habitable tomorrow? Here's a template, the ratio, the proportion of how buildings should look. And giving aging buildings a green makeover. In New York, older buildings, they're cutting the utility bill by 80%. Well here, what you're doing with the school building, HVAC. The building's still a stupid building. Still a stupid building. Winston Churchill in 1960 said, we shape our buildings thereafter, they shape us. So here's five takeaways from Governor Ron DeFure, barnstorming tour of early states, and he states humble. He compares himself to Churchill fighting the woke mob on the beaches. <laughs> I just read what Churchill said. So what are you doing? Are you listening to what Churchill said? I don't think so. Florida school districts are losing leaders. And here's one of the leaders saying, we've got, we've got, no you have, got's past tense. And then here, we desperately need a new electrical grid. And they're showing green vines going between the towers. How ridiculous. So uh, let me end on a light note. Uh, you know Disney. They have a new dwarf. You know the name? It's Wokey. Yeah. For all you Disney fans, remember the name. DeFure. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, my name is Antonio Anisi. What is book banning? If you deconstruct the phrase as you would with alcohol ban or tobacco ban, one could guess book ban means you're prohibiting or forbidding citizens access to a book by law. PEN America, one of the most prominent organizations in this fight today, defines a school book ban as any action taken against a book based on its content and as a result of parent or community challenges that leads to a previously accessible book being either completely removed to students or where access to the book is diminished. No matter how many times we state that our efforts are for removing sexually explicit books from the eyes of minors, it will always be misrepresented to the public because of flawed definitions like PEN America's. It is concerning that there are grown adults that cannot objectively understand or see the issue with school employees showing minors graphic pictures of young boys giving other boys oral sex or adults giving advice to middle schoolers on how to use adult sex apps. Because books with this content are still available to minors in Hillsborough County, clearly a majority of the school board members are unwilling to remove them. This violates Florida Criminal Statute 847. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. Well, in light of this hot topic of the books, I'm here again to address the issue. 
So when anyone in a public forum says that someone is trying to ban books, this definitely gets attention. It calls imagery to mind of totalitarian regimes that want total control over all of the flow of information, hence the word totalitarian. Labeling someone a book banner is designed to evoke an emotional response and to liken that person to a fascist. But we have to ask ourselves, is this actually what's happening in America? Are fascist parents taking over? Let's consider real fascists like Kim Jong-un, Mao Zedong, Pol Pot, Stalin, or Hitler. And under these regimes, capital punishment was not out of the question for these book violations. And now compare that to the USA, where any person is free to possess any book they want. All books are accessible pretty much anywhere, and it's not a crime to own any book in America. Additionally, no one has lost their freedom to read whatever they want simply because a book is not on the shelf of a school library. There are millions of books that are not on the shelf in our school libraries. Does this mean they are all banned? No, it just means that some person in authority has decided which books are important or appropriate for children and which books do not make the cut. The real question is this, who gets the right to determine which books? Do parents have any say or is it the professionals? Clearly many school systems across America believe that they have the right to overrule, ignore, dismiss, and contradict parents when it comes to the books that are offered to their children. Let's be clear, it's intellectually dishonest to suggest that parents are banning books. No one is legally prohibiting books if you go by the definition of ban. While using the word ban is far more powerful, using it comes at the expense of intellectual honesty. What we parents are talking about is more like regulations, regulations that mirror other organizations' regulations, like the Federal Commission's Commission, the Federal Communications Commission, which bans obscene content on radio airwaves 24 hours a day. Perhaps the most closely related ban is this. The movie industry, with its rating system, bans minors from accessing certain movies until they are adults. You probably banned your children from eating certain snacks before dinner. Were those snacks actually banned? No, they were just reserved for a more appropriate time. I would encourage you to resist the book banning narrative, which is inherently dishonest as well as divisive. Labeling parents' attempts to protect their children from the graphically sexually explicit content that I've read to you again and again in these board meetings. Labeling this as book banning may be politically acceptable, but again, it's intellectually dishonest to do so. I, nor my colleagues, have any desire to ban books. We simply want to protect children, and we won't be silent until we do. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, and if um, speakers five and six can please come up. Thank you. Good afternoon, Debbie Hunt, CCDF, Hillsborough, Hillsborough Citizens Defending Freedom. Um, I'm, not, I'm here to talk about the consent agenda item 904, about the um, Committee for Children license renewal of the Second Step Middle School Life Skills Curriculum. There's a couple of things that were a little concerning to me. The, in the description, it, the terms that were used are very similar to the renaming of the SEL terms that are in a later, or later agenda item, the Student Code of Conduct, conduct revisions. Um, it's also stated in here that there's a 25% savings, but when you look at page 11, it really looks like a 10% savings. There's also um, a requirement to pay in advance, which I thought was quite concerning. On page 6 of 23, it talks about conf types of confidential information which may be necessary to disclose to the contractor. Um, including social security numbers, credit card numbers, expiration dates, pins, card security codes, bank routing numbers, et cetera, medical information. I think that's a little concerning that it would need to go to any contractor um, for this. When I go out to the website, Committee for Children says, we believe that social emotional learning, SEL, is fundamental to achieving social, social justice. And they also state that they are leading the SEL revolution. When you go to the Second Step Programs um, website, the second click you make on programs clearly denotes that all of the programs are social emotional learning. Um, it says that middle school is a time of growth and change, 
Second Step Middle School, our social emotional program for sixth to eighth grade, um, which is not appropriate. It also, on another page on the site, says it claims SEL is just as important as reading, writing, and math. I don't think there's anything that backs that up. And in one of the videos that talks about an ups, they, it's called Upstander, and it talks about you would think Upstander would mean upstanding citizen, and then it goes on to talk about qu kids questioning their sexuality, which I do not think is appropriate, and I also think violates the law. Um, I've provided for you a letter that had been sent previously to the superintendent talking about social emotional learning having no place in Florida classrooms. It was about a different curriculum, but it would also apply to this. So I recommend before approving this curriculum and before continuing the, the K through fifth that's in place, that you relook at Florida laws and this curriculum. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, my name is Amy McCabe, a resident of La Colina Subdivision. I did a great deal of research and emailed each one of you after the recent vote to rezone our community from Bloomingdale to Brandon High. There's one final vote, so this is my plea to ask you all to reconsider this change. I have had personal experiences with my oldest child who attended both schools. She thrived when she transferred to Bloomingdale. Many of you are parents yourself and are very familiar with the vast variances between these schools. We want our children to grow and be challenged academically. Bloomingdale is currently ranked 14th compared to 28th in the county of Brandon High. That is a significant decrease given there are 30 counties in the schools in the county. We would be assigned to a school that is almost ranked at the very bottom. The programming, music, athletics, and academics are subpar to Bloomingdale's. I have three kids who have all attended or are attending Bloomingdale currently. Two were in the music programs, always receiving superiors, in comparison to Brandon, receiving good. My third child played lacrosse, which is not even available at Brandon. It's gut-wrenching to think that our kids will be shifted to a school that misses the mark on so many levels and has lacked for years. The shift in zoning is intended to alleviate overpopulation. Our community has 292 homes. River Hills has 1,160 homes and was to be rezoned from Newsom due to overpopulation as well. But River Hills, which is almost four times larger than our community, mysteriously got removed from rezoning and remains at Newsom, even though Newsom has an even greater population issue. If you look at the rezoning maps, Bloomingdale is currently bringing students in all the way from Claremel District. Why are we not rezoning them to go to Brandon and leaving our community at Bloomingdale? If it's for diversity purposes, you may want to review Newsom as well. They are greatly lacking in demographic, demographic diversity. My final plea is for you all to consider the emotional stress that we'll put on the students. They will attend elementary and middle school with the same friends and will be expected to transition to a whole new high school with only a handful that would come from our community. That puts an entirely new layer of stress on a young person. In addition, this will cause division in households during the next few years during the transition. Families would be split between Bloomingdale and Brandon. My ask is that you would put yourself in our shoes. Would you personally want this for your children? Would you be content with sending your child to a school with significantly lower academics? Would you be happy with a 28th ranked school in the county? I truly do not comprehend how a small community of 292 homes would continue to overpopulate Bloomingdale. I ask you to reconsider keeping our community within the current zoning. I may also suggest the school board consider a much more stringent requirements for proof of address. Through an audit of enrolled students, I think you may find a significant number of your students that do not live in the school zones that they are attending. My final request is this. If my voice is not heard and the rezoning to Brandon is approved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello. My name is Carrie and I am speaking on behalf of my son, Logan. There are two places a child should feel safe, at home and at school. Turner Bartels, where my children went, has failed to provide a safe environment as we parents have expected. My son, Logan, started the school year on a positive note. He has been on IEP since he was seven years old and he has been determined to do well in school despite his learning disabilities. In fact, he earned a very first A ever on his first report card. 
constant bullying, name calling, physical altercations, and kids taunting him in class has made it a struggle for my son to keep concentration on his grades and keeping them up. The bullying and physically inappropriate behavior from other students started occurring just a few months into the new school year. My son has had his bike vandalized, trash thrown on him. He was jabbed in the neck with a pencil. He's had his pants pulled down in the locker room, and he has been chased home on his bike by others stating they want to beat him up. He's even been called racial slurs. Every incident was mentioned to either teachers or the admin staff, as well as obtaining several case numbers from the resource officer. The disappointment that we are feeling because every time we have filed a complaint, nothing's changed. These occurrences have increased and have escalated to more serious interactions. My son has to, have, has to defend himself physically from being attacked. He started having anxiety attacks, increased depression, and he would tell me constantly how afraid he is to go to school. Fast forward to the most recent incident, which took place on Monday, May 22nd of this year, the last Monday of the school year. My son texted me at 118 saying, Mom, pick me up now. I knew from that text something was very wrong, so I drove to the school, which was about a mile away from our house, watching my son walk his bike while being harassed by over 30 kids. The fear in his eyes will forever be an image that I cannot let go of. These kids were yelling at him, shoving him, and trying to force him into the street, almost getting hit by a car. When I got close enough to him to be able to put his bike in my car, the kids all gathered around me, blocking the road. I could not escape, yelling obscenities and racial remarks at me as well. A few of these kids, again, stood in front of my car. I couldn't move. Once our so-called help arrived, which was some of the um, administrative staff of the school, most of those kids then scattered. Only a couple were detained. We went back to the school to have the nurses assess for my son's injuries, gathering details as to what happened, filing reports, to which he ended up sustaining a sprained shoulder because of these kids grabbing him off his bike and throwing him to the ground, which then injured his bike, um, taking the chain off. So he couldn't even get away. This brief insight is what I want you guys to know about Turner Bartell's staff doing better to providing a safer environment for all children. Bullying is unacceptable, especially when they tell your child that thank they want to kill you. him. And yes, he got a text thank stating you. that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just try to make sure I'm consistent with the time for everyone. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Um, to the board, Ms. Radson, and the cabinet. My name is Betty Smith. I am a teacher and my certification is business technology. So it was a phenomenal opportunity for me to witness Ms. Patel receive her recognition for the application she developed. I'm here for three reasons. Reason number one is to ask you to assign someone to look into an escalation. This is the final step for me in terms of the es escalation process, to assign someone to review a situation that I have with regard to completing my ACP certification. I won't get into the details because I don't want to get personal. So I would just ask you to assign someone to meet with me separately. The other thing, is I, wanted, other thing I wanted to do is I want to make myself a poster child because it is my opinion that in my experience in ACP in technology is representative of why minorities, especially blacks and women, are sorely underrepresented in technology classes and as instructors and professionals in Hillsborough County Schools. I believe there should be an investigation to understand why minorities, particularly blacks and women, are treated the way we are in technology in Hillsborough County. I also believe that I'm a poster child of the failures of the site-based ACP process. I came into Hillsborough County from corporate America. I was in IBM for 30 years, Fortune 100 company. You don't stay in IBM for 30 years if you're stupid. 
right? And we have this motto, preparing students for life. Well, I can tell you that you're looking at what your students are headed toward, the kind of professional that they're headed toward. And that is exactly why we need to do a better job in Hillsborough County with regard to preparing our students for technology careers and allowing professionals who are minorities and women to be in the technology program in Hillsborough County. I'm happy to meet with someone individually offline to talk about the details of my complaint. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And this concludes our public comment section. I need a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. I have a motion by Member Vaughn. I have a second by Member Washington. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. I will now call on Superintendent Davis to highlight our administrative appointments. To the chair, thank you so very much, Chair Combs. Uh, this evening we have an opportunity to announce a number of new school leaders and leaders that are moving from one location to the next to be able to lead our schools in Hillsborough County in, in order to create the best moments we can for teaching and learning to be able to expand the knowledge and intellect and, and growth of every one of our students, but also build capacity of the adults within our organization. This evening, I want to be able to start with our, our first leader. Uh, do we have the PowerPoint ready? He says, yes, sir. Let me see. The first leader, uh, this is in, and I call your name, please come up. This first educator has been an educator for 24 years. 15 years has been an educator in high school. Eight years as an educator in middle school. One year educator in elementary school. This individual is currently the principal at Haines City High School. He serves 3,000 students. This individual has improved the graduation rate, decreased the discipline rate at his school, has been acknowledged as the 2022 National Association of Secondary School Principal of the Year and also National K-12 uh, Die Principal of the Year as well. It is my pleasure to recognize our new principal at Rogers Middle School, Mr. Adam Lane. Lane. Mr. Lane comes from us for, from Polk. We appreciate it. Welcome to uh, Hillsborough County. Had a chance to, to meet with Mr. Lane the other day. Had a real intense conversation. He is ready for the lead, ready to take on the roles and responsibility. And welcome to Hillsborough County, sir. Congratulations. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, got that photo moment. Get him while smiling. <laughs> Just kidding, smiles every day. <laughs> Somebody get a picture, he walks out the door. <laughs> As he drives up tomorrow, just kidding. The next one, we have an opportunity to highlight a young man that's a product of Hillsborough County. Uh, I believe this individual uh, was a product of Armwood as well. Went to Armwood High School, attended University of South Florida, went on to get his master's degree at West Florida. Uh, went to, came back to Hillsborough County, was a social science teacher, also transitioned to be an avid teacher at Brandon High School, then transitioned to lead the Collegiate Academy at Armwood, then moved to 2016 as an assistant principal at Armwood, then went to an assistant principal at Robinson and, and decided to come back to Armwood and is now our new principal who's done a really good job at Armwood moving the graduation rate, the new principal at Tomlin Middle School, Mr. Matthew Johnson. Please come up. Congratulations. No worries. Got those Go Gator colors on. We'll take that. Tom, here. He, listen, he walks right up for the photo op. It's like awesome. <laughs> That's right, buddy. He's, he's hey, day one ready. <laughs> Congratulations. Also, we have a new principal going to Bing Elementary School. Uh, Cheryl is not here this evening. She has 20 years of uh, education in Hillsborough County. She's been at Dickinson, Lomax, Schwarzkopf, in which she's been there for 16 years. Community truly loves her, going to miss her, but it continues to be open for a challenge. She is a community builder, a, a great at being able to focus on, uh, you know, intentionally about moving the analytics uh, with instruction. And we welcome Cheryl to Bing Elementary School. Let's give her a round of applause. Next cohort of leaders, we have a, a 
Make sure I get this. We got a 2G remote and get it back to 5G real fast. We have a graduate from the University of South Florida. This individual was a teacher at Lake Mag in 1997. Uh, transitioned to be appointed to AP at Palm River. Then in 2007, began to be a principal at Waimama. In 2009, transferred to Cypress Creek, I believe, and then transitioned to um, his current location. He is a strong leader, community builder. The new principal at Brooker Elementary School is Mr. Roy Morale. Congratulations. Thank you for what you do every single day. Thank you for, for leading. You know, we, you don't have to come up here and shake my hand, man. <laughs> I appreciate you. Thank you for, for what you do for our children and uh, Kodak moment. He's still smiling after 20 years. <laughs> we appreciate you and look forward to helping you in this process. In addition to our next leader, started uh, in the career in um, as a paraprofessional in 2010, and this is a really an uh, awesome success story from going to a paraprofessional, transitioning to a an, you know to an ESE specialist, was a teacher ESE specialist in 2020, was named as assistant principal at at Forest Hills, where she was instrumental a part of working with Mrs. Gordon of elevating the experiences to the highest C the school has been uh, ever. This individual's passionate. For, and really focus on being able to build a cohesive unit with their with their team. And the new principal of Forest Hills Elementary School is Mrs. Michelle Soto. Congratulations, you are the new principal. <laughs> Looks like you brought that fan club tonight. <laughs> Congratulations. We appreciate it. We know you have uh, a number of support factors here with a, a historical trend of great leaders with Rachel, now uh, Mrs. Gordon moving up, and they're here to wrap their arms around you to make sure you're successful with Shay as well. So congratulations. We look forward to some good work. Also, a new principal graduated from, I believe, is a product of Hillsborough County from Tampa Bay Tech in 1996. After that, uh, earned her degree. She came back to teach with us and uh, did a really good job of not only being a teacher, but a district peer evaluator, then became an assistant principal, assistant principal at Bernie, BT Washington, and, uh, you know, where she currently has continued to demonstrate success. She's the assistant principal at Frost. The new Frost Elementary is Miss Tamika Lewis. Congratulations. <laughs> Make sure everybody, all of y'all come back to work tomorrow. <laughs> Enjoy that night. Just kidding. Uh, also, uh, had an opportunity to, uh, you know, current principal, Ms. Christina, is transitioning out of uh, Mendenhall, coming to the district level to work with our, our ELL cohort. So congratulations to her, which opens up a, a current position at uh, Mendenhall Elementary School. We have a 24-year veteran in Hillsborough County that really has served as a teacher, as counselor, and administrator has served uh, many families and many students across this district from Tinker, has also served at Maybury, Lanier, West Shore. The new principal at Mendenhall Elementary School is Mrs. Skylar Geyer. Uh oh, got a click. Congratulations. Thank you for what you do. You all need to do that. We appreciate what you do every single day. You hear me? And uh, know that we're uh, continue to be on your team and support you in those efforts. Also, we have a new principal because we have another principal that transitioned the ELL cohort and uh, was, so opens up Ruskin Elementary School. Began her career at Mintz Elementary School in 2005 as a third grade teacher. This individual in 2011, she became a peer evaluator. 2013, an assistant principal at uh, Stowers Elementary School. 2017, an assistant principal at Claire Mill. And then 2022, a assistant principal at uh, Rampello K-8. Our new principal, and we welcome her to Ruskin Elementary School, is Mrs. Janine Sadler. Well deserved. Congratulations. Everybody get the pictures. Congratulations. We look forward to supporting you. All right, we have an opportunity to, to employ a 31-year veteran in Hillsborough County, an individual that started in 1992 as an ESE educator um, at uh, Miles Elementary School, has served as an administrator at, at many uh, you know, placements within our uh, organization, Maniscalco, Piso, Oak Grove, has extensive knowledge about being able to bring uh, individuals together as a, multiple, as a major strategist related to being able to move the needle intellectually with students and being using data points and, and really a systems thinker. The new principal at uh, Schwarzkopf is Pamela Wilkins.
She's going to ride by. We're going to wave at her on the way, on the way by this evening. But, uh, Pamela, I look forward to connecting with you as well. And then also our, our final uh, appointment this evening is an individual that uh, began her career in 2012 in Hillsborough County uh, at Dunbar Elementary School in, <laughs> in her fifth grade, has, uh, has, has really transitioned to be a transformational leader, uh, as was a lead teacher at Magnet as well. And then 2017 was appointed at Tomlin Elementary School as assistant principal, where in 21-22 moved up over 108 points, which is major points when you look at the Florida accountability system. Uh, we thank her for being data, data-driven instructional leader as well. And this is our new principal at, Tomlin, at Thompson Elementary School is Casey O'Brien Swope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Congratulations. Um, you know, is she ready to go? I right, listen. Listen. I, and here I thought. And here I thought. Oh, Matthew was camera ready. She was ready to rock and roll. Congratulations. If we have family members and supporters stand up, I just want to thank you for your ongoing support. Because you need to understand, this job isn't easy every single day, but they will continue to be champions of change as they move the needle. Thank you so very much, and don't feel the need to hang around. Go celebrate, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you. Congratulations, leaders. And we're going to give everybody a few minutes, so that way, if people want to leave. Congratulations. As you know, your families will continue to work really hard. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Yeah, right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. The following items will now be heard, C-111, C-402, C-502, C-603, C-701, C-704, C-708, and C-711. C-111, K-12 Comprehensive Evidence-Based Reading, CERP, for the 2023-2024 academic school year. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. For the chair, we are required annually to be able to bring a K-12 Comprehensive Evidence-Based Reading Plan to the board, and this is for the 23-24 academic school year. This document really outlays and identifies all of our literacy goals that we will seek to accomplish in the 23-24 school year, and also provides ongoing supports, professional developments, tools that we will use along with data analytics to be able to show where we currently are and where we aspire to go as a school district. When you look at this, there's three major buckets that we have focused on in this particular document. One is foundational skills based on the science of, of reading. We know when you look at co reading comprehension, it, it really is truly a product of decoding along with language comprehension as well. And then the second thing, we'll, which we'll do a lot of training over the summer and as we transition the next year. The second item we'll focus on is how we will ha continue to strengthen our Tier 1 in literacy instruction within our school district and really go into how we continue to help students from a Tier 2, Tier 3 small group instructional practice and provide ongoing professional development to our teachers as well. And the third one is all about professional development, how we provide ongoing professional development through literacy, not only for our administration, but all of our leadership teams, our coaches, our teachers, our reading specialists, all to be able to make certain they understand high yield reading strategies in an effort to accelerate learning. Um, this will provide, uh, this document provides ongoing literacy practices and also interventions that we will put in place. And it also requires that we have ongoing professional development and training for our literacy and academic coaches as we move forward. So we look forward to a good plan. We know that there's um, 
when we look at our PMA data, there's major areas of opportunity. When we look at kindergarten, our PMA data on PMA 3 is 60 percent of our students are, are deemed proficient as a new state allocation uh, administra administration of their assessment. The biggest thing we've got to look at when we look at, um, you know, our, our current data for our PMA is really focused on third grade. Uh, we are at 45 percent uh, proficient for the, for the third administration of the PMA, and that is about 3 or 4 percent lower than the state average. So we have work to do. These are students that were exposed to uh, that have missed a lot of instruction in the two years, primary years that were so important. But we, this plan will allow us to move forward and navigate with a strategic plan to be able to focus on reading blocks, skill blocks, and, and provided intervention as we move forward. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? I do, thank you. Um, first of all, I've got, I've got a lot of questions answered, so I appreciate that. Um, but I do have some questions about the funding and how it seems there's been some, well, not so much some questions, but there seems to have been some funding differences um, because of changes with legislation. And really, I would just like to understand when we talk about our workshop about those changes, because I know we've consistently asked for more flexibility and this seems like flexibility, but I want to really understand it kind of from the legislative point. So I got a lot of questions answered, but moving forward as we have our legislative workshop, I'd like to understand also how any of the, the bundi, bu budget funding categoricals have changed. So it doesn't have to be a question answered right now. You're more than welcome to answer some things right now, but really I'd like to, to highlight it at the workshop and understand these changes going forward. Sounds good. Ms. Pepe, anything? Thank you. Um, no, just based on the conversation we have, but we can address it later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I need a motion, a second to approve C-111. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Rendon. Okay. Are there any other comments for this agenda item? Okay. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 402, request for proposal, group health plan. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. Recently, we've been informed that Humana will no longer serve entities such as ours. So that their last uh, you know, dates of being able to implement insurance plans for our organization will be the end of December going into January. Therefore, we had to put an RFP out in December to be able to identify a new group to be able to, to facilitate and be able to serve our, our, our major workforce related to health insurance. Um, through this, the insurance committee met on multiple times and it reviewed multiple bids and made a recommendation that Aetna, Aetna Life will be our new carrier. With this process, we um, a number of things were implemented to ensure that we are in compliance with where we currently are with making certain we have a zero premium option for our employees, which this board has been really well about. It brings forth $1,000 of health reimbursement for our employees. The employees have an opportunity to have a larger network of pharmacies that they can activate and be able to engage with. They also have a CVS care pass, which they'll get around $10 a month to be able to spend as a, as a savings. And then also, Edna offers a 24-7 nurse line at the same token being able to have virtual health care as well. So Edna's bringing in a, uh, you know, multiple options for us. And um, when we look at this, we, I know that there currently it is a two-year agreement with a 30-day out termination clause that we put in every one of our contracts to be transparent about that process, but bringing in a, uh, a provider to be able to make certain that we have seamless transition from one provider to the next as we move forward. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion, a second to approve item C-402. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Vaughn. Member Vaughn, Member Rendon, and myself, we pulled this item. Um, we can go ahead and begin with Member Vaughn. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, you can imagine any change of our benefit packages causes a huge amount of anxiety with our employees because our benefits are, you know, part of part of the compensation. Um, and I appreciate a lot of information as well that you've sat down and shared with us. Um, and I appreciate you highlighting some of the things. Some of my questions are more just to alleviate the anxiety around this for our employees and some questions that I've gotten as employees have realized that, you know, we're switching insurance. Um, one, is there going to be an interruption with providers? Is that a concern that we're having? How is Aetna going to mirror Humana as far as that? For people who have preferred doctors, what are we anticipating with that? The chair, Doc, you're going to answer. Yeah, that, can you hear me okay? Gotcha. There you go. Uh, that's a great question, and part of our evaluation is to look at disruption. I'm happy to say that Aetna has over 99% uh, lack of disruption for our uh, physicians, so we should see minimal uh, disruptions for our employees. 
Okay, thank you. Um, also, I think one thing that was important is while we're going to be changing for Aetna, I, I know I had asked you, like, my son might be starting with orthodontics for dental. Um, is that going to cause an issue with that? We're not changing providers for dental, so there shouldn't be any interruption if people have plans with that. We're still keeping Humana with that. Is that a, is that? Yes, ma'am. Humana is staying in the business for dental and for vision and also for our Medicare Advantage. Thank you. Um, and then what what was so great about Aetna? Why is the reason that they won the proposal? What are we excited about when it comes to Aetna? Help people understand when we're switching why we chose Aetna, if you could short in a short, in a short amount of information. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I mean, part of uh, we, we really went out and said what companies are out there that can match what we have, because we've had a successful program with Humana for 28 years. And moving away from them, there's change. And, and, and by the way, we're going to be fine. We're going we're gonna to get through this. Uh, but we were trying to match as much as we could and then figure out where we could tweak. So they first off brought a competitive offer. When we uh, look at other offers that were out there, they were millions less than most. So that was a big thing, knowing that there was very minimal disruption on the pharmacy side, on the um, uh, participant uh, network side. It just made sense. They will match our, we will have a well-being program. It won't be Go365 because they don't have Go365, but Aetna has committed to helping us get a, a great program. We know that over 50% of our employees participate in our uh, health and wellness program, so we need to have a program that they keep doing that with. Uh, they just nailed it. We Not only did they provide a good uh, submission, they came in and did presentations for us. They had their medical doctor with us. They had their pharmacy. It, they just uh, showed that they could do it. All, all the programs were great, but they really just had the edge with the competitive pricing as well. And then I just have one last question. When and how quickly are we going to bring all of the information for specific details forward for employees, and how can they find out this information so that they can know as quickly as possible what their new insurance is going to look like? Well, our procurement team has been really good about saying, Tracy, you can't meet with anybody until this goes to the the board here. So we've got our Aetna team, our Aon team, our employee benefits team. We are meeting tomorrow, so we will begin the heavy lift. And while we know that over 99% of our uh, physicians are going to be remaining in network, that's not going to make me feel good until I'm looking up my doctor and seeing that she is on there. So we will get that information out to employees as soon as we can. Over the summer, for sure, we'll put them up on our uh, website. We'll get it out there when they return in the fall. We will have train the trainers at sites. We will have newsletters. We will have drops in sessions at the ISC, a health and uh, wellness fair. We'll have it all so that come September when it's time to make their enrollment selections, they'll be prepared. But, but we've got this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Rendon. Um, You know, I I appreciate the fact that we've gone out and we've gone to a bid and we've really done our due diligence to look for a a, a policy that meets the standards of all of our employees as much as we can. What I'm concerned about is that we're still sticking with traditional medical policies. And although it's the lowest amount of increase, we're still increasing out of our teachers' pockets 2.8%. And that's basically the raise we just gave them. And at the end of the day, I think we owe a responsibility to this district as one of the largest employers or the largest employers of Hillsborough County, as long as one of the largest employees in the state of Florida, that we have to step out of the box. We have to do better research. We have to look at additional and types of insurance plans that are going to meet our staff needs, giving them better benefits, less cost to them, and less cost to this district. And in order to do that, we have to step away from traditional plans that are making money off of our backs. And at the end of the day, right now, it's our teachers and our district that is paying the price for that. So I'm going to publicly state right now that although I want 100% coverage for our staff, I'm going to charge this district in looking outside of traditional insurance companies And so my vote on this is not about our staff not getting coverage because I know they need coverage and I want them to have the best coverage. But this coverage takes away every dollar we just approved for them. And this coverage takes away the benefits we could give them better, that we could pay them more if we are paying out of pocket as a district more. And so I challenge this district to do better. We have to do better for our employees. And I have not seen any evidence from this district on any plans that don't take out of the pockets of our staff. 
yes, they're not paying coverage, but we as a district are paying that full coverage and therefore unable to put more dollars in their pockets. So we have to do better. We have to do better by our employees. And although this is the best traditional policy, it may not be the best policy that we could offer our staff. There are districts around the state, districts around the country that are self-insured, that are doing better than us. And we need to change that. Okay, thank you, Member Rendon. Um, and I, I, I'll, I am, I'm in the queue, I have a couple questions. Um, thank you for saying that. I do think we have to look at things in every different way, but when you look at teachers, there's a lot of teachers that insurance is probably one of the most important reasons that they work in that consistency. I think teachers have had a lot of inconsistency in the last couple of years, and we wanna make sure. Now, my question is, I'm, I'm not opposed to that, but was there an opportunity for anybody to bid for self-insurance? Did What did that look like? What, what did the committee look like? How many people bid for that? Did someone who kind of thought out of the box, did they bid for that? What does that look like? Um, go ahead, please. When we went out to bid, we, we did a fully insured bid, and so uh, we only looked at fully insured. So there was no self-funded option out there. Um, and we can, in future, look at, look at that. In the years gone past, the reason that we didn't go that route is because of the fund balance required, but when the district is ready, you know, we can certainly go out and do it. But at this time, it was just a fully insured bid. Yeah, and I think um, Superintendent Davis, it's really about getting, we just had an increase in our bond rating for the first time, right? We're just trying to make some really fiscally difficult decisions right now, and I think we have to be in a really good, healthy financial situation. Or, or what do you think? What does that look like to you? Yes, Mr. the Chair. So I don't disagree with both parties. So at the end of the day, this is about timing. So it's about timing. When are we ready and primed and prepared to be able to make that transition? We are moving in a really nice spot and uh, through our hard work, through our financial recovery plan to get to that spot. Openly didn't think it was the time right now. We do believe that it could be in, in the near future as, as we continue to move forward. We've had some conversations with some individuals that are extremely impressed with about their abilities to determine what our next steps could potentially be. And, and for us uh, right now, I think the, the best thing to do is, is the transition to, to leverage Aetna and use them as a provider, and then also start to look at where we are from a um, you know a financial perspective, where we are with program design, where we are with being able to potentially look at, and you could either be partially insured, self-insured, or fully self-insured. And those are elements as, as we start to move forward and we get the school year started, we understand claims, we understand the number of individuals that are on our policies and on our insurance to determine what we can and cannot do as we move forward. So I don't disagree that it's a uh, definitely an avenue for us to to explore it's just about timing as we move forward and will there be a committee or somebody to look at all those options and what it looks like and i know like in orange uh, county miami dade they have self-insurance will we look at what works what doesn't work what it looks like long term absolutely, absolutely. have okay. to okay so okay okay that, that was kind of my question thank you uh member rendon so the 30-day clause what does that mean because we all know that we, we need more than 30 days. If they're going, if we accept this bid right now and we take on Aetna, you guys have told me that we have to start enrolling in September. So that 30 day clause and a two year contract puts us again millions of dollars backwards if we don't, if we don't even explore options as a district. And so I want to know what that 30 day clause means. No one's going to sit here and go on, you know, December 1st. We're not going to do Aetna on January 1. That doesn't make any sense to me because we would put our staff in jeopardy. So with that being said, I want to know, like, what is our commitment? What, when you say we're going to look at, what does that mean? Are you, are you saying that we're going to look, do a exploratory committee to get us evidence as a district? Are we going to do a workshop? What does that mean? Because as a board, we don't have all the evidence to make this decision. We have the evidence to make a traditional insurance plan. But we don't have all the evidence to make the best decision for the employees of this district right now. And that bothers me that we would not have that evidence. So I need to know from the departments, when are you going to get us the evidence that we will be able to make a decision or at least move forward to bring this to the table? And Because two years is a long time. And two years, we're risking a lot. Because in two years, are you going to come back? Because does this... 
excuse me, one more question. Does this mean that they're going to, their rate is guaranteed for two years? Yes, ma'am. We have actually a rate cap for the next year. We hope it'll be lower than that, but we do have a rate cap for the, for 25 which, should we stay. Which is good. It, well, it's good for a traditional plan one, but again, we're looking at employees that this doesn't even cover their raise, right? Their, their increase to their insurance isn't even covered by the raise we gave them. Can I clarify that one? Sure, yeah. So um, actually, because we have a new structure design and next year with for employees plus children, most employees will see a decrease. Um, I spoke with someone recently who re reached out and said, if I had to, it was a, a teacher who said, I would like to add my two children to the plan. How much would it cost? And right now I would have to say it's $593 a paycheck, which is like ugh. next year because of our new structure, it will be $335. She's going to save $5,000 next year. So but there, we as a district are paying 2.8% for every employee that they are not being covered. That's a dollar or more that comes out of every other staff that we could put somewhere else. So even though an individual plan may not cover it, when we're picking up the 100% cost, we are picking up that, which means ultimately we can't pay our staff more. So ultimately everything that happens when this affects our teachers, and I don't care what we're doing, everything has to revolve around our teachers and our students. I'm sorry. I yeah, know you're good. Uh, Superintendent Davis? Yes, Mr. Chair. We, we don't disagree. Uh, as we look at uh, continue to move forward our financial recovery plan, as we look at and the unknowns with House Bill 1, I think it's premature for us to launch into any initiative right now. Let us get started as the school year unfolds and allow us to kind of build that capacity of where we are so we understand numbers, financials, budgets, income, expenditures, generation of funding, and then we'll have a better understanding. I do believe, though, we can have a conversation as we get into the, the front half of the school year about what this looks like, what can we take on, what we can do, and uh, in the term of how fast we move. So this doesn't, you know, for us, with a 38 30-day exit clause, they know as well that, that in 30 days there could be a motion that we move in a different direction and say in one year we want to go to self-insured. We believe that we're ready. That's something that we'll have professional conversations about or whether or not that's one and a half years or if it's at the two year. This is totally up to the board and uh, about where we can go and what we can do so you can have the relevant information to make an informed decision. You know, when I came in in 2020, the big deal was to go to self-insured. I'm so glad we didn't go because COVID hit, claims went up, everything went kind of left and right, and, um, you know, to a point where it would have hurt us tremendously. Member Vaughn? Thank you. Um, I appreciate Member Rendon's passion for making sure that our employees get the best health care possible because that's a huge priority, especially in this country with health care as it's considered. So many of uh, our employees have families and health care can be a huge drain. And I appreciate that the conversation has gone in this direction and allowed me to sit several times and ask a lot of questions and really understand the difference between a traditional plan and self-funding and what that looks like. And, you know, what I hear and I just want to kind of verify is we are all in agreement that's the goal, and we'd love to move towards that. Right. Um, and that from a perspective of our CFO and the person in charge of HR and our superintendent, that there are some things that have to be in place, such as the $29 million, $39 million kind of threshold savings that you have to have in that specific categorical to make sure that you can cover any kind of additional you know, claims that you weren't anticipating. And so I think that we are working there. And I'm glad that you're passionate about that and making sure that our employees get the best. That's something we should all be going for. So I, I see that you, know, you would like that to move faster. And I don't think that we disagree. And hopefully, we'll be able to work through that and meet the ben benchmarks to make that happen. Because I think that's a goal for the board consistently to make sure that we're offering our employees the absolute best rate in health care and affordability and giving them the best benefits as possible. And I know you both have said it was a priority, but from when I've sat down and gone over and asked a, a lot of questions about it, it just doesn't seem that we're there yet and that, that we're moving towards that. So I think we should cons you know consistently talk about it. I think it's great that it's from the place that we want our employees to have the best and to, to move forward. And I hope as soon as we reach that point and we can confidently do it, it's the action that we move towards personally. Thank you. I agree. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Rendon? I, I just want to clarify that although we went through a lot of hard times in 2020 and 2021, remember, it's the insurance companies that 
with the American Recovery Act got the money back that we've been putting in because of the claims that have come back. So although we were not self-insured at the time, there would have been a difference of what we paid and what we didn't pay with the American Recovery Act. There was a lot of different things that happened during that time. So it's not just dollar for dollar that we would have lost. I want to make sure we publicly make that aware that there are things that we need to look at. And where I'm coming from is we don't have the information because I specifically asked, we've not done the research to say, is it better or is it worse? We don't know that. We do know that we do have financial ability to do that right now. So let me make that clear. We do have the financial ability and our resources to do it right now, but we don't have the research of whether or not it's a sound plan for our district. And I wanna make that clear. And without that knowledge, I find it to be, that's why I'm gonna be evident about when it happens. Because again, we wanna look back and say, well, I'm glad we didn't, but insurance companies got that recovery money, not us. We could have gotten that recovery money, but we didn't get it because we were not self-insured, which we could have then given back to our employees for co-payments and other things. So let's be careful on what we do and don't say, because we do have a good solid financial base that we really could make that decision. However, we don't have the evidence from the options to even make that decision. And that's where my problem is. We only have the evidence on the traditional plan for this district. So thank you. Thank you, board members. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes with three yeses and one no by member Rendon. Okay, next up is 502. Approve the revision to the student code of conduct. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. Annually, our role and responsibility is to bring a student code of conduct to the board for approval. That way, we can get this information out to all of our constituents, with our parents, our teachers, our administrators, our students, to be very clear about what expectations are as we move forward. And this is all related to uh, academic and uh, sorry behavior expectations within our school district to be to bring clarity how students interact not only with each other but with their facilities and also with their employees. It will teachers and our employees as well. Therefore, we stood up a 26-member uh, committee to be able to re review the Code of Student Conduct. This is inclusive of district leaders, school-based leaders, principals, teachers, community members, parents, all to be able to look and comb through this analysis to be able to make informed decisions. A lot of the changes are informed by the Department of Education as they change from looking at um, you know, larceny and theft to grand theft, being able to look at physical attack to simple battery, and clearing up vandalism to be criminal mischief. And, and, they, and we also updated some social media disruption uh, definition along with providing clarity of exemplars of interactions or uh, infractions that have been identified within our school district. And then having stronger language with the electrical devices and being able to make certain that we're very clear about what, the, what can be recorded in the same token, what photos, uh, which is nothing within our school district, and at the same token, uh, no pictures should be taken as well. They are prohibited, and just being clear in that process. So just bringing this aboard for recommendation, this committee met between April and May, and Josh Crystal and his team have done a really good job spearheading this effort. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-502. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Vaughn. Member Vaughn, you pull this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Yeah, um, well, Mr. Crystal and I spoke earlier today, so I, I did get some questions answered, uh, or all my questions answered. I want to clarify a few things. One, the, the point that I think was really important was that you mentioned this is a living document, right? So this is what we have now, but we can make changes and amendments to it as needed as we go forward. I want to just publicly clarify sh that and make sure that we're all understanding that um, so, and then um, the next piece that I wanted to just kind of point out is, you know, we have so many parents contact us about, you know, our procedures and what that looks like when they have concerns. So I just urge everyone, not just teachers and employees and principals and admins in charge of this, but our families to actually look at this and understand what this looks like um, and what our policies are on that. So everyone has an understanding that way. If people have concerns about it, instead of us, you know, just going through a committee or 
are making decisions, we can actually get feedback from our community and parents or, you know, families about, you know, what that looks like and what our community wants. So I really just, a lot of these I pulled for informational items just to talk about it so people know that people work on these things and we do discuss them and they come through. So I urge parents and families to look at this and if they have any feedback, again, this is a living document so we can always incorporate that and move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Washington. Uh, Josh, I just want to thank you too because, um, you know, people are under the uh, perception that we kick kids out of school and we don't save the kids. That's not true. Uh, we have kept more kids in school now than I've ever seen before in my 40 some years with this school district. And I just want to personally thank you uh, for keeping our, keeping our kids in school. Thank you. You've done a good job. Yes, thank you, Member Washington. I also want to concur with Member Washington. Even going out to the Tampa Epic North and seeing all the things that you're doing and all the all how hard you work you and your team to make sure that just because a child makes a mistake it doesn't, you know, it doesn't follow them for the rest of their life. So thank you and your team for all your hard work. You definitely are making a very big difference. Thank you. Members, please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 603 proposed calendar for the adoption of the fiscal year 2023 2024 budget. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. In order to be in compliance with the, uh, the truth of millage, which is our trim outline, we have to be able to bring a calendar to the board for approval. This is really approving the adoption cycle of our fiscal year for the 23 24 school year. So bringing this board in alignment with the uh, Florida statute under Section 200. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion, a second to approve item C603. I have a motion by Member Vaughn. I have a second by Member Washington. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? This is just one of the informational items. As we move forward, there's always a lot of conversation about our budget, and I just want people, to, you, you know when we get to our millage, we'll have lots of conversation about that formula and what it looks like, but I just want people to start looking at these public documents that we have at the meeting, so if they have questions about our budget and our process, this is completely transparent, and people know it was on this agenda, and they can look at it. And that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Please bloat. I mean, please vote when your lights appear. Bloat, too. Okay. <laughs> And gloat. <laughs> and it passes unanimously. 701 approved 223025 SSD Florida Transportation Systems Incorporate. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. This is approval for a vendor with Florida Transportation Systems. They do a really good job of working with, uh, with us providing parts, services, and propane engines for our propane buses. About over the 1,100 buses that we have, around 90 are propane driven. This is environmentally friendly buses. We know that, um, that these do a really good job for us. However, we purchased these in 2017, 2018, and they are now starting to transition out of the five year warranty window. So, being able to come back and identify a vendor that can really sell us original equipment, manufacturer parts to bring to the board. Um, we would expand the propane, however, it's just uh, they have a short span where they can travel with the propane and um, and we want to be able to look at as many electric as we can as we move forward anyways. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-701. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Rendon. Any questions or comments? Member Rendon? Yeah, question, you know, as we look at this, and we've talked about this in the past for other vehicles, are we looking at leasing again so that we're not pulling for our general revenue funds? Mr. Or is this just parts that we need to have for repairs? To the chair, this is just parts. Just parts just for the parts. for the. Okay, yeah. so we can't really do much with that. No, no. All right, thank you. Thank you, Member Rendon. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes with three yeses and a no from Member Vaughn. Okay, 
704, proposed bell schedules for 2023-2024 school year. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. Every year we look at bell schedules for every one of our schools and make sure we're more efficient with our times and make certain we are hitting our instructional hours and that transportation is going to be able to cover. When we look at this, the majority of our school district remain the same. We do have nine changes. Uh, six of those are high school changes to be able to make certain they have sufficient time to meet instructional hours, but also have sufficient time to safely travel from one location to the next, as we have some very big campuses on our, uh, within our organization. And then you will see the three changes from K-8, so we have a number of schools transition to K-8, and that will be K-8 from Carewood. Also, we have Collins, and then I believe Woodson is making an adjustment to their K-8 as well to make sure they have sufficient travel time and are hitting the instructional hours required by the Department of Education in the state of Florida per statute. So bringing this aboard for acknowledgement, the sooner we can improve this, then we can put this out on our website and be able to push to our constituents so they really have a better understanding of when, what time their children transition to and from school. One thing I will say, new legislative change this year to be able to move high schools and middle schools at different start times. There are only two counties in the state of Florida that comply with that law. One was Hillsborough County. Congrats to those who led that effort a couple years ago. And then also Alachua County. So none of our times were disrupted due to that statue. And I appreciate the leadership that we're forward thinking as they move that in the, in the right direction. That's, that's great. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C704. I have a motion by Member Rendon. I have a second by Member Washington. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Yeah, I just want to clarify, for anybody that this affects, we're not just going to push it on the website. They're going to get some kind of personal touch point to understand that whatever times they were expected are now going to change and very clearly know that their times are going to change. Just Absolutely. want to clarify that. Yes, ma'am, through the chair. I don't want the year to start and a bunch of parents to be like, I had no idea. Yes, ma'am, through the chair, we definitely will. And we're only talking about between five and seven minutes or some a tall 10 minutes adjustments within those schedules. So we will absolutely send it through parent links. We will send this through any, with, through Canvas and any information that we can that we can educate our community so they know what time start times and end times are for every one of our schools. And then I know last year we approved it, and then we had to tweak it a little after school started. Are we anticipating that, or are we... No, ma'am, to the chair. There were some, there were some one or two schools that we just wanted to make sure we're in, we're in the same stride. So we do not forecast that this year. This should be set in stone, ready to go. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 708, invitation to bid 23006 MST, purchase of fertilizer, herbicides, and insect chemicals. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am, the board. This is an opportunity for us to identify two vendors to be able to help us with our facilities, whether it be able to look at practice fields, baseball fields, softball fields, football fields, and, and grounds uh, to be able to serve them through fertilizer, herbicides, and also insect chemicals. Uh, what this does is really allow us to not only purchase the product, but allow us to allow district trained personnel to be able to serve our, our schools to ensure that we have a proper treatment and pro proper safety procedures at every one of our schools. So being able to, and this also allows us to be successful with all, any fields that we have. This is a $96,000 expenditure and bring it to the board of discussion because we can only use general funds to be able to cover this. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-708. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Rendon. Anybody want it? Would anyone like to discuss this? Member Vaughn? Uh-oh. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to clarify because I know that we had some issues where there were there was some pesticides and things that we were using that was harming some of the wildlife around the schools we talked about that I just want to confirm that as we are approving this that's been thought into it and that this is not going to be an issue for wildlife around our schools and get some clarity around that through the chair, yes, ma'am. We will continue to work with our providers and make certain that we have an environmental friendly uh, engagement with any of the treatments that we have and serve, and we'll make certain that Mr. Farkas's team continues to have that conversation. I know they've already been on it, but we'll, we will make sure we revisit that as we move forward. Mr. Farkas, are there specific things we're doing to make sure that it's not going to injure or cause problems with the wildlife around the school? Like when we had that issue, how did we kind of address it, and how are we continuing to address it? 
There's two ways. The first one is the actual bid that we put out this time to make mm -hmm. sure that we put that in the bid that there was a, that the, they were non-toxic and the issue we had before was, was addressed in the bid. So everything that came back with both companies already was in line with that. So it kind of solves that problem up front. Did you say there are two ways? Was there no, a there's second? two companies. That two did. companies. Okay. Thank you. Two ways. Uh, thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Rendon? Is this going to solve our ant problems at our fields and on where our students are playing? No, um, you live in Florida still. So yes, it will address it, but it's not going to solve all. Of it. Well, but seriously, I mean, the, the, seriously, ant piles around our schools where our kids are walking, where our kids are on the fields. It seems like it doesn't matter what we've been doing in the past. Every single event we have, there are red ant piles everywhere. So we need to make this sure some of this money goes there. Well, there's two things. We've solved it on 21 of the football fields so far. Uh, there are not any piles on those. Um, no, but honestly, we don't allow our traditional staff to put it out. They are certified people to do it. That, that's a blessing and a curse because uh, you only have a certain number of people. The other problem is they have to be certified to do that. And as we talked about, and we've met with Ms. Johnson a bunch and her team and, and, and Dr. Whalen, it's about the salary schedule. I and mean, that is a big part of it. There's not people that can go make a lot more money doing that uh, pesticide work other places. Um, so as we address that and the board has already shown a commitment to do that, I think that will help us in making sure we get enough people out there to address those situations. So it, it is always going to be a problem in Florida, but we do need to do a better job of addressing it. Have we compared actually doing a contract for someone to come in and do it with the approval compared to our own staff doing it? Not just that. We've visited other places that have done that. Uh, Mr. Moore, head of maintenance and myself, went to Nashville Public Schools because they have a contract that does on the outside. So we're looking. We have one more trip to Atlanta uh, that's coming up in about three weeks because we want to see it firsthand. Everyone promises they can do that. But what does that look like in action? So as we look at the outdoor and that, so yes, we anticipate bringing that towards the board. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 711, approved guaranteed maximum price GMP for high school UUU, project number 100207. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. This is bringing the GMP for our new high school UUU. We know that we have two schools in the southern Hillsborough County area that are at capacity, over capacity with Sumner High School and also Leonard. We've got to have immediate, uh, uh, you know, response to be able to build a new new vertical facility to be able to make certain that we help with student capacity. So this is bringing to the board to be able to launch in 2025 a brand new facility serving 3,500 student stations on on campus. This is probably the most expensive expenditure building a brand new school, and the Beck Group will be building that. It's actually twice as expensive as anything we've ever. So I got to say it. It's just the consumer price index and all the pro everything that we've dealt with have have tremendously gone up. And uh, the Beck company does the Beck Group does a really good job, and uh, they will build a state of the art facility. We will be using impact fees to be able to do this. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C seven eleven. I have a motion by Member Rendon. I have a second by Member Vaughn. Um, and I pulled this item, and basically my comments were very similar to what you said. What what did it look like the last time we built a school? I guess just just focusing on the increased cost of building overall capital. It's a great question. Um, the last high school we built was about seventy four million dollars. It was smaller though. It was it was twenty five twenty six hundred kids. We did Sumner. Now we added a wing onto that, so you can add another ten to twelve million dollars onto that. So it really ends up being about eighty five. Um, this one is for 3490, uh, based 3,500 student stations. So it's larger than what we built. Um, but the way that you can tell the market and the construction marketplace is very simple. They put out a bid. Beck does a great job, and Harvard Jolly is our architect. Puts it out and says, hey, this is what we have for electric. How many people are going to bid on it? That sets the tone for the marketplace. When you have enough people that are bidding in each of those, masonry, low voltage, all the different things that they bid on, that's the real cost. So the cost has gone up. There's no question. Just for a reference point, the electrical bid on this project um, is the same price as what it costs to build Belmont Elementary School, just the electrical bit. Um, so it, it, it has changed, um, but as Ms. Renda knows and, and Dr. Hahn knows from their area, there's such growth down there. The alternative is to have too many kids at Sumner where it's, where it's not safe. So we are gonna build it, we're planning for that. There's not a lot of land down there, so we are building a larger school for that. Um, the difference is, we're planning it smart. Harvard Jolly's done a great job of providing infrastructure. So we have larger hallways, larger cafeterias, larger art rooms, larger elective rooms. 
EA Sports. Lots of neat things that we look forward to showing the board as it goes forward. It's an incredible design, um, but it's, it's definitely an expensive project. We think it's going to be worth it. We think we're going to be able to keep those kids in the Waimama area at that high school. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, Member Rendon? Um, you know, I just want to thank, you know, district staff for doing everything you can to get this rolling. I mean, as we know, there are 25 schools over capacity predominantly in the East area. You're right. It's unsafe to have our students with such large capacities in our schools. We've been fortunate to have safe schools, um, but we really want to make sure we're doing our due diligence. And so getting this on the books, I want to thank all of you for the time and the effort you put into it, getting the architecture moving. Um, it It's so late but so needed right now right so um the faster we move the better and so thank you guys so much for making this a priority with these new schools i mean it's 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 hard to look at when we're looking at boundary changes as we move forward that, that we have to do these new schools and it's the shifting of the population that is really hard for us all to comprehend and, and work around. So these are difficult decisions that we all make on a regular basis and it, it affects our students, it affects our teachers, and it affects our community and the lives of our families. And so, you know, I think it's important for them to understand that we're doing this knowing where the capacity is and trying to meet those needs before as fast as we can. Um, because we want our students to be in a healthy, safe environment wherever they're at. And so um, Thank you guys so much for doing that. And I also want to thank the curriculum side and our other side for working with our existing schools, making sure we're providing opportunities outside of the box so that we have students staying in our um, long-term older schools where we've got opportunities where students don't have in our new schools. And I think that's important to, to note as we approve a new school that we have so much opportunity in all of our high schools, in all of our elementary schools, in all of our middle schools, that just because it's a new shiny school doesn't mean it's the best school for you. The opportunities are out there in all of our schools that really could meet your needs. And it's important that we recognize that this is about capacity, not about the shiny new, because all of our schools have great programs for our students. So thank you guys. Thank you, Member Rendon. Member Vaughn? Thank you. Can you just really briefly just explain what impact fees are? I certainly can. Impact fees are paid when a new house is built. It's part, it's tied into what they do with a permit. Um, it's based on the size of the house. An average size house, about 2,000 square feet, is an $8,000 impact fee when they build a new house. It's paid, put in a fund with the county commission, and then we draw that down to build new schools for new companies. Who pays it? The developer? Yes, the developer is the one responsible for it. And so how do we ensure that the impact fees raise with the amount of construction? So we're talking about one to two years ago, the difference in pricing. It would make sense that if it's twice as much as it is to, to build and develop and building costs are twice as much that we would then look at our impact fees to make sure that the developers are paying the, the same amount of money as it costs with inflation to make sure we can afford these schools. Are, is that happening? So, uh, Member Vaughn and board members, impact fees are entirely controlled by the county commission. And so impact fees, uh, especially in the school um, realm of impact fees, have traditionally been fairly low. They've been raised a few times over the past, but that's not a decision this board um, gets to make. That's a decision the county commission gets to make. So uh, Mr. Farkas has an excellent relationship with the staff over there. And at some point, it probably would be something that this board would look at about whether we would want to seek um, an impact fee raise on school impact fees. But that's something that we would work with um, the county on. Okay. I think did you have something to say? Well, and through the chair, Mr. Porter is absolutely correct. And I believe it went from three years ago, $4,000 to $8,000. And if there was a study conducted, it would say that $8,000 would particularly be low for this particular area. They are. And there was a period where they were not raised for about 10 years, which really put us in a very bad position that had a lot to do with yeah. the economy and the makeup of the board. Um, so that's something that's always up, up for discussion and an appropriate discussion to have with your colleagues at the county. So. Just as Member Rendon loves to charge our staff with <laughs> doing the best for our employees, I would love to see if we can start opening that conversation because it has been such a substantial change in how much it costs, and we know we're going to have to build several schools. So I think it's an important conversation. If we can start looking at that as a board and moving forward, I'd appreciate that. Yes, Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously.
Now we will go to an informational item. Hillsborough County Public School Annual Growth Management. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am. With our interlocal agreement with the school facilities planning, siting, and concurrency with Hillsborough County and local municipalities, our own responsibility is to be able to give an annual report to look at the overall effectiveness of of the number of forecasted schools, the number of FTE, looking at the number of bills within our community to be able to show reports of our funding sources, facility plans, and enrollment trends within Hillsborough County and residential development as we track that. So bringing to the board this report to be able to show that, um, that we are uh, paying attention and working with the Board of County Commissioners to be able to have that uh, correct forecastability of where we need to build and what our projections will be. Mr. Farkas, anything? No, I think it's an important vehicle to what Ms. Vaughn actually just said, which is here's our report, here's what we're doing. This is a great opportunity to talk about whether those impact fees are, are aligned with the cost of construction. Great vehicle for that. that. Okay. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. What we'll do is we'll move on to, um, oh, I'm sorry, Member Vaughn. Um, I just want to clarify, from what I'm seeing here on the student enrollment data, it looks like through the years our elementary school enrollment has gone down but what consistently has gone up is our high school enrollment right middle school stays about the same so it seems like we'll be shifting needing less elementary schools and more high schools so that's something that we should all be talking about as we move forward I mean we talk about how growth is happening and we need more schools but it's evident that it seems to be high schools is where we're getting the influx and actually losing an elementary is that right it is, and a lot of it's because of the charter growth that you see. The charter growth is in elementary. You see a lot more elementary charters than you do. You see some middles or some K-8s, but that's where you're losing the kids to. It's not that ours are going. It's the new students are all going to uh, charter. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Please vote when your lights appear. Oh, yeah, it's information. I'm sorry. Um, so what we'll do is we'll have the superintendent comments, then we'll go to employee input, and then the and then we'll do school board since uh, it's it's closer to six. We'll we'll start with superintendent comments, and then we'll do the employee employee. There's an employee here. Yeah, we have one employee at least. We'll start with you, superintendent, and then we'll do employee. Excuse me, to the chair. I want to talk about a little bit of celebrations uh, that we've had and some, uh, you know, where we are with our, our tax referendum dollars. But the first thing is congratulations to individuals for National Merit Scholarship Awards. We have three students that have been, in a, you know, uh, one corporate sponsorship of the National Merit Scholarship. Congrats to them. These individuals that are at Str uh, Strawberry Crest, Sickles, and King High School. Um, these are students who continue to be, uh, you know, exemplars in our classrooms and continue to make certain that uh, Hillsborough County Schools is always highlighted within our school district. In addition, you know, Steinbrenner Robotics Team won our national championship. The more that we can get uh, coding, robotics, uh, you know, system thinking within our school, the better we're going to become every single day. We see, in, you know, outside of the United States, other countries are taking coding, robotics, and implementing those and penetrating into the core classrooms. It's now become a core. And we see a number of jobs that being uh, continue to be manufactured, automotive, with artificial intelligence and coding. So we have got to continue to keep this in the forefront, not just of a before or after school activity, but finding ways to really instrument and drive this in our core content every single day. So congratulations to Steinbrenner and our students. Thank you for, for continuing to represent us in an in a, in a outstanding way and bringing the recognition back to one of our local high schools. In addition, tonight we had a chance to, to highlight students who have perfect attendance and how hard this must be every single day, uh, you know, when we have bad days, no matter what, when they were sick, no matter what, they showed up every single day. So highlight to Dylan Anthony, Alicia, also Dante, Eric, Tyler, and Mason as well. Uh, congratulations. We thank Suncoast for being a champion for us and being able to give and extend these individuals tokens of appreciations and recognitions for their hard work, and we we'll want to recognize them tonight as well. Also, Iris31, Jay Mize does a really good job being able to celebrate 25 educators in Pinellas, Pasco, and Hillsborough County. Uh, they spend $1,000 per educator, and these are who continue to show influential reliability, uh, selflessness, and, and are really humble to practitioners. They did three areas that they celebrated the, uh, with throughout our community in the Tampa region, and these are the individuals that were recognized for a uh, $1,000 uh, partnerships through Iris 31. Jason J. Mize does a really good job being able to help us and, and just recognize our teachers, and we thank them so very much for being a continued champion. And Anne-Marie 
for helping us with this process. And then also, I don't want to. I want to make certain that during this summer transition, that all of our parents all know that we have summer food services. These summer food services are at our summer school locations, and they are free of charge from any student that uh, or any children up to 18 years of age or younger. They are open Monday through Thursday. Uh, please work with your school to identify uh, in the front office what hours they're going to be open for lunch and for, and for breakfast as well. But again, these meals are completely free. We ask our individuals to transition to www.summerbreakspot.org to be able to identify the location and when these offerings will be, uh, will be take place uh, within our schools. So thank you for our schools for hosting. It is so important that we make certain our students have the essentials to excel every single day as we continue to move forward. And then graduation. I think, the, I think this board for, you know, going over and beyond the number of graduations they had to go to, they were very, uh, you know, uh, attentive and present and had so many celebrations with our, our students there and also our cabinet and our leaders and our principals as well. It was so great to be able to see, you know, 15,000 students walk across the stage, shake their hand, fist bump them, whatever it may be, just to tell them congratulations. And uh, just the, the respect and the, uh, the gratefulness that our students had as they transitioned from one side of the stage to the other side. And the board had a chance to meet unique seniors as well. And I think so rem such remarkable and special stories that will last forever. And we thank our students for continuing to be champions and all of our teachers that help our students get to the finish line. We had students working the day of graduations to get there to hit the, the benchmarks and thresholds. And, um, you know, so awesome to see. And, and we'll work all the way through August to be able to get our students to that part where they have and earn their diploma in Hillsborough County. So congratulations. And also, as always, we want to thank our community for the half cent sales referendum, sales tax. We have 14 major projects that we will implement within our school district in the, in the summer, and that's $47 million that continues to go to our schools to be able to address the deferred maintenance that we continuously have. As you know, we'll start losing capital money, so this is so instrumental to our community to buy in, and we've uh, pushed around $560 plus million plus of initiatives to be able to address the, the ongoing overarching needs of our school district to make certain, as Ms. Rendon talked about, had the safest and most attractive facilities every single day within Hillsborough County and in the, in the referendum is a major part of that process. And then also suspend the agenda tonight. We talk about Transformation Network. Um, yeah, Ms. McCray, you want to you highlight this, this slide? Yes, yeah, super excited about the fellows. We started two years ago. This year, we had 107 applicants um, throwing daily. As a matter of fact, I got a text message <laughs> sitting here today. We got five more fellows in the summer school. And, uh, and we hired, we have hired fellows in the teaching positions for next year. Um, but our T in schools, we have 29 with at least one fellow, um, 54 that are currently assigned to schools plus five, so 59. Um, and we are continuing to grow um, the opportunity for college students to come into our schools and work with our students. So this program has been um, a great ESSER project for us, and we're continuing to work with them through uh, this upcoming year. Thank you so very much, Ms. Cray, and thank you for what you and your team continue to do, and also Sue as well. And, uh, and, and next time we'll bring uh, some literacy updates and talk about our partnership with the University of, of, of Florida through the Lassinger Center and how we'll continue to make certain that we have ongoing focus on literacy within our school district as that is an area we must be able to move that needle. And i got to tell you, it can't just take teachers, leaders, uh, and support staff. It takes an entire community to wrap their arms around literacy. Caregivers, business partners, the chamber, delegations, mayor's office, everyone has to be rolling in the, in the, in the same direction to be able to move literacy and parents within this community. And we look forward to be able to engage, actively engage in every one of those entities I spoke about to be able to make certain we move the needle. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Hope you had one last thing. Oh, well. Sorry, we're doing a really good job with Just. We had a, a slide of moving students, and uh, Shay and her team and the community if, if face team have, have contacted almost every parent to get them to a location where they feel comfortable. And this is the customer service the board has demanding from our staff. Our staff has done a really good job. Thank you to Ms. McCray and her team. It really talks about the number of students that are going to Dunbar, Tampa Heights, Lockhart, and other opportunities that they've had. And this is all about community engagement and making certain they have the right and the best educational experience as they transition to the 23-24 school year. So thank you. I want to make sure we provide that update. Thank you, Shay.
Thank you. And thank you also for that detailed email with the provided updates for Just Elementary. I think that's really important because we are all very interested and we want the best for those students in that community. Thank you very much. Um, we will go ahead and we will do employee input now and then we will go to um, school board member comments. We'll now take employee input even though we hear public comment at the beginning of the meeting. It is sometimes difficult for employees for our district to attend the meetings at 4 p.m. There are many ways for employees to make their voices heard through union representatives, emails, phone calls, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and public comment at the beginning of the meeting. The board wants to hear from you. With this section of our agenda, we're creating another avenue for employees to speak to the board. We're setting aside 30 minutes for employees of the district to speak to the board about any issues that are on your mind. This is not intended to be a discussion about specific agenda items on tonight's agenda, but rather an opportunity for you to speak to the board about any issues related to your job or the district. Each speaker will have three minutes. We have one speaker tonight. Thank you. Hi, Chris Adenica from Gaither High School. Thank God we made it through the school year. Um, uh, Going to be a little bit of a negative Nancy here. Uh, sorry to all the Nancys. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about credit recovery. Um, just before I totally get started, I don't know if this is a, my school issue. I don't know if this is a district issue. I don't know if this is a state issue. Um, but credit recovery is supposed to be a second chance for students who failed a class, which they absolutely should have that, right? We all make mistakes. We should have consequences. That consequence might be that you have to take the class over again or something like that. Well, credit recovery should be a second chance that's equitable to the class. That means it should have the same standards. I've been told by students and by others uh, that the credit recovery class is easier or has fewer standards or lessons than a typical class. Um, a bigger issue I have is that the program um, that's used is Edgenuity. And if we all know about Edgenuity, I did e-learning through, um, through COVID, um, there are websites, specifically Quizlet um, and Brainly and other ones, but Quizlet specifically has every answer to Edgenuity that's, that's there. Um, you can just look up the assessment tell it what class and tell it what assessment you're using and it will give you every single answer. You can sometimes even copy and paste the question, it will give you the answer just on Google. Um, and so obviously that's an issue when my, my students or another teacher's students are, are having that, that issue. Um, the other issue with that is that then students can go ahead and finish it much faster. A student in front of me while I was talking to one of my APs uh, told me that they finished Algebra 2 in three days. How is that possible? Without, th there's no possible way to do it without there being cheating going on. An additional issue is that this year there were students failing classes that were needed for graduation. They were put in credit recovery while still in the other class. The other, it, the issue with that is that that teacher was still held responsible for that student's grade while the student knew that they were already past the class through credit recovery. This leads to issues in the school like classroom disruptions, skipping, and in, it just uh, snowballs from there. We've got to figure out a better situation for that credit recovery. They absolutely deserve a second chance. It should be equitable to what they are missing. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes our employee input. We will now move to board comments. Okay, Member Washington. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, congratulate the men of vision. They had a 17th annual class of 2023 scholarship ceremony. Um, my wife and I, we donated to a young man that would be tending, uh, be attending Foley and M University, uh, Mr. Jack Jackson Hopkins. He was the salutatorium uh, of the school. Um, they raised over $30 million for scholarships. And Mr. Ross and them, they are doing a great job with those young men. And they're all a successful. In fact, they had something to come back and, and make some positive compliments. So, uh, Mr. Ross, you're doing a great job, 
and I continue to hope you continue to do a great job because we got to put these young men ahead and so they can be successful in life. Um, I want to talk a little bit about graduation. I thought it was great. I got a big thank you to Jennifer Sperano, uh, the director of administration, also Hillsborough County Public School District safety personnel for inspecting the premises every day. Also Hillsborough County School security personnel for managing the crowds. And we did have, we did have some large crowds there and making sure each graduation was safe. Also, uh, Hillsborough County communications personnel for taking for photographs or unique seniors from each school and publishing great videos on social media for each graduation. I think it was real great this year. We had a great time. We had a lot of people and they were well behaved. I guess I'm the only misfit because I had them reaping a little habit in the crowd, <laughs> but that's what I do. Uh, oh yeah. I threw the speeches away. They loved the kids loved it. You know, Little did they know I didn't have a speech anywhere. I can say that now. <laughs> but anyway, we had a great time, right? So we, had, we really did. We all had a great time. And, and thank you. I want to thank you also, Miss um, Renner, for coming and helping me out. I was a little handicapped there for a little while, but she came and helped me out. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and in my closing, I want to say happy birthday, Chair Combs. Thank you. You're a young lady. Okay. Real young, huh? Happy birthday. Not, not that young. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're, you're young. Happy birthday. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member Washington. Member Rendon? You know, I just want to, I don't want to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish with my positives at the end. <laughs> I'm just going to lay it out there now. Um, you know, I didn't pull our curriculum because I know that our staff are doing their due diligence and really being aware when it comes to our science curriculum. They're doing a great job of, making sure they identify the standards that our students are getting and our standards that our teachers are teaching. Um, but I do want to make sure that we publicly acknowledge the fact that currently right now on our approved science curriculum that is in gap form, that we have two textbooks that are not on the approved list and several others that have content that are not in a part of the standards. And so I want to publicly make sure that we as a, as a district are ensuring our staff are focusing their teachings on the curriculum. And so I, I want to just want to make that comment. And I know that we are, but I think it's it's important to note that that it's something that, you know, things change and we're, you know, we're not ordering textbooks right now. So um, the other thing is I want to thank um, Ms. Whalen's office, Dr. Whalen's office for um, the staff. We have many openings in the, sta in the department right now. Um, and I had a conversation with her and I'm thankful that she is going to be giving to the board um, weekly or by, uh, every other week updates on our staff vacancies. I think it's important to know that. I would like to add if she could also let us know um, when she provides that exactly what we're doing to recruit teachers. What are we doing to recruit those um, staff that are coming in for internships for next year, those incoming students? Um, I think that's critical that we as a board need to know where we're moving. Nobody, including our cabinet and any of our staff, want to be there at the last minute again, having to jump into classrooms. We want our staff to feel comfortable and ready to go on the first day of school. So um, thank you so much for her to do that and keeping that up. Um, and I cannot say enough about Jennifer Sperano and everything she did. Um, we as a board did not make it easy on her, let's be realistic. Um, last minute phone calls, last minute changes, who's coming, who's not coming. Um, and she was just, no matter what we threw at her, it was a smile, we'll take care of it, and it was handled. So um, when you've got thousands of students and even more thousands of families um, and coordinating us, doesn't always come easy, so um, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I do also want to thank our cabinet. Um, they were there every single day making sure everything went as smooth as possible, um, and that is kudos to you and kudos to Superintendent um, for your leadership within the with our cabinet and our security and everyone. Um, graduation is such a special time for our students and our families, and to know that we as a district do it well just shows it it's a culmination of from that first day of kindergarten all the way through 
Um, and so thank you for everyone that just went out of their way to make it special for each and every family. Um, truly an honor to be a part of it. Thank you, Member Rendon. Member Vaughn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree. I concur. Graduations were phenomenal. Thank you for covering for one that I needed you to cover for. Superintendent Davis, how many did you do? 38? <laughs> um, they, they ran so well. Everybody was so prepared. The kids were great. It's, it, there's no words to really describe how great it is to be up there and feel the enthusiasm and feel how excited the families are and see our kids come and graduate. Like, it's a really special, it's exhausting, but it's a really special time. So thank you to everybody who, who makes those happen. I don't think people understand how much work goes into preparing and speeches and making sure everybody knows where to sit and there's a bottle of water and everybody knows where to go. And so, um, um, especially to absolutely Jennifer Sperano, amazing job, um, and everybody involved with that. And and to, congratulations to all of our seniors. Like, you know, what an accomplishment that is. And for all of the families, it's just that's 13 years of projects and last minute things and string performances and sports. And, you know, so much goes into that moment. It's really, it's really impressive. Um, also, I, I wanted to speak, um, Member Combs and I, and I believe she's going to show it in her board meeting comments. We went to um, the Gentleman's Quest, which is put on by a, a former employee, Tavis. Um, and it's really just about mentoring a certain crop of students, providing financial literacy, making sure that they have an educational plan after school. School, and it was their graduation. It had all of their seniors um, who were all off to amazing things, FAMU, um, FSU, USF, to do things all the way from programming to making sure that they're going to do a uh, cybersecurity. Uh, one person was actually going to do a construction apprenticeship or carpentry. Um, and talk about scholarships, the amount of money that they were going to give to those kids and people even donating from the, from the event itself because they wanted to make sure all the students really, you know, had, uh, had what they needed was amazing. So thank you to that, to that organization for, for providing support to our students and that much opportunity. Um, also, I just want to say thank you and congratulations to all our employees. You know, I don't think we had a meeting before school ended. So to all of our teachers, admins, to all of the cafeteria workers, our bus drivers, everybody, thank you so much for another year and for all that you do for our students and investing them um, and making sure that they're successful to our staff. You know, every single year is such an accomplishment, especially these days. So thank you for all of your hard work. And to everybody who's working over the summer, thank you so much to making sure that we're ready for, for up and coming. And then and lastly, you know, June is, is Pride Month, so I just want to say um, happy Pride to everybody, um, to all of our students, employees, and families. You all deserve to feel included, valued, free to love whomever you want, free to be whoever you are without judgment, um, and I just want you to know that I support that. So happy Pride to everybody, um, and happy, happy summer, everyone. I hope everyone has a good, safe, and healthy summer. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. And since we're going to leave early, I'm going to do an hour closing. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I, I really, first of all, I wanted to recognize a very important person in the crowd tonight. We have this young gentleman, Daniel Hauser, if you'll stand up real quick. Okay, he is a, a Boy Scout, and this is part of his marriage badge, is to actually watch a meeting. And, and he's a, yes, if you want to, Daniel, if you want to come up here to watch the closing comments, um, you know, and he is a, a, a young man who will be, in entering eighth grade is that correct daniel you're going into ninth grade and going to sickles alonzo okay i knew i knew you were in district one and that's for sure so this amazing young man is 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 bright and tenacious as you can see and um daniel i'm gonna i'm gonna show a couple videos and then i'm gonna let you close out today if you will i'm gonna show a couple videos so um one of the goals that um as a school board member is for me to try to um visit the schools and visit schools on a regular basis and really to find out you know, how what's going on in school so pablo if you could share a couple of videos i wanted to share just the last couple of weeks of school i was able to visit quite a few schools um first um joe malloy at crestwood elementary on the left hand side he retired so we were able to see a retirement with him and then on the right hand side um steve lunan and the lunch staff at sickles high school we were able to serve i was able to serve lunch to the whole um the whole class ninth 
10th and 11th grade. So it's a great way to know students. And then I was able to do access graduation at Sickles. On the right-hand side, our new Egypt Lake principal, Dr. Magadish, and she um, walked around and we're really working on making sure her campus uh, continues to thrive and do well. And then you'll see um, over here on the left, I was able to finally visit McFarland Park, which is amazing because every student in that school has a violin. I was really blown away. And then on the right-hand side with Dr. Flores and, and Tampa Epic North and getting to see the counselors and getting to see all the things that they're working so hard for the students. Um, and then a couple more photos. There we are with Dr. Florence, and that young man ended up being the turnaround student for Tampa Tampa Epic North. And on the right-hand side at Lowry Elementary, I was able to see my first big book war competition, which was, like, so intense. I mean, it was so close. Um, and so that was really great with uh, Principal Spagnuolo. And then at Davis Elementary, um, God, okay, this is the book war, book wars as well, and you can see the competition. It was just so intense. I can't tell you. I said I want to go every year from now on. Um, and then a couple highlights um, is that the Tiara Club at Davis Elementary is a fifth grade organization that recognizes, and you can see it on the next video as well, all fifth grade girls as they're rising. And Miss G, who is an amazing, amazing teacher who started as a pair of professionals, she basically works with fifth grade students for the entire year. And they learn how to believe in themselves and be successful later on in life. And here we have the new principal who's doing great things, Miss Izahar at Davis Elementary. And then the last couple pictures is we have Deer Park over there, a big field day. And then I got to see Miss Livingston and her amazing music teacher. Um, there and then finally we ended up at Tampa Bay Boulevard um, with Miss Perez and on the right hand side is the Gentleman's Quest is what um, member Vaughn was talking about is these young men and how successful they end up being Commissioner Gwen Myers was there as well so that was really great um, and congratulations to all of our graduates and you can see these young men um, a lot of them received scholarships that evening so this is what it's all about congratulations to our seniors and if you can just we'll go ahead and hand this over and you can say um, the, the meeting okay well you will help them okay and Daniel are you ready future school board member okay um, and you can press and then you can say yes and you can say this meeting is adjourned well seeing that there is no further business this meeting is adjourned oh. yeah